Boom! Oh, oh welcome to Thunder lights. Nerds. <laughs> I'm Brian Henson. I'm Sarah Veselov. And I'm Frederick Philip Von Weiss, and thank you so much for consuming the Thunder Nerds, a conversation with the people behind the technology that love what they do. And they do, do tech. tech. Good. Good. Pow, in yeah. unison. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, everybody, for joining the show. Again, really appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for uh, subscribing to the show. We got 500 plus subscribers now. Uh, really super neato, cool. Brian, why don't you take it away? Yeah, I want to thank uh, this season's sponsor, Auth0. Uh, thank you very much for sponsoring this season. Uh, what, what is Auth0? Well, they make it easy to developers to build a custom, secure, and standards-based unified login. They provide authentication and authorization as a service to make it super easy to set up. Uh, go to Auth0.com to set it up today, and I'll pass it along to Sarah. Oh, my job is to tell you to sponsor. Uh, no, sponsor. Oh, my God. Yeah, bring it back. Bring it back. <laughs> so, uh, disclaimer: I'm going to get a lot of words messed up today because, like, my brain is not working. So, I'm here to tell you to subscribe, not sponsor. But you can if you want. Um, you can reach out to Frederick about that. That actually would be a good idea. So, subscribe. Uh, go to our YouTube page, and there's a big button. Where is it, Brian? Top right, top left. Down, down, down there. Down, down, down there. Yeah, Hit that down, button. Yeah. You'll be able to watch us mess up in real time. Because, you know, why not? And uh, you'll get bloopers and all kinds of awesome content. Yeah. Nice. Love it. All right. Well, hey, with all that being said, and without any further ado, let's go ahead and get to our guest. We have the CEO of Cantilever Web Design and Development Studio. Is that, that what we call it, Ty? Yeah. Studio? Let's go with that. Yeah, we're a studio. studio. Yeah. yeah. Ty Fujimura. Welcome to the show, Ty. Thank you so much for having me. It's yeah, an our pleasure. Yeah, thank Ooh, you for an honor. Oh, yeah. The Thunder Nerds? It's a big deal. I put a shirt on. I put like a real <laughs> shirt on. I haven't had like a collar on in months. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah it's, I, like a, it's like a tux. He's got a, a really nice tie you know, yeah. for our audio mm -hmm. listeners. <laughs> yeah, you should check it out. Go to, go to the uh, YouTube and uh, take a yeah. listen. But yeah, look, I, I actually put on a tie. I haven't worn a tie in forever, except, you know, I'm on the show. Um, yeah, I know what nice. you mean. So how, how are you? How are you doing with the uh, Dunker Shade? How are you doing with the uh, COVIDs? Are you uh, surviving? Are you uh, uh, you know, trying to not leave the house? Are you staying in? What's your situation? Yeah, we're doing okay. So we're in uh, North Jersey. So I'm in Fairlawn, New, New Jersey. And so it's one of the hardest hit counties in the country. So we've been very, very cautious. Uh, luckily, no one kind of close to, to us has been uh, sick. So that's been really... Um, you know, a blessing. So we've just been camped out at the house and, you know, we're lucky to have a yard and a little patio and some space to exercise. And I've got uh, two young kids um, who are doing distance learning, which my, my wife is uh, wrangling uh, quite capably. And, you know, we're just trying to ride it out, try to flatten the curve. It's, I figure, you know, it's, it's going to be hard to avoid, uh, exposing yourself at some point but why make it early might as well push that off until later so just trying to be part of the solution as much as we can yeah exactly yeah yeah i i love uh, you know it's weird to say it just i don't know not, not many people where i say this but i love new, new, new jersey it's beautiful like the garden it is the garden state if you drive outside of like the city area <laughs> the countryside it is so pretty there i have like no idea how like the perspective you get it's like jersey like no it's beautiful state. yeah like, well, every what, place has their own thing what most yeah. people know about new jersey is uh newark airport and oh, the yeah. sopranos both of which do not deliver <laughs> a very no. positive impression of the place <laughs> so yes new jersey's lovely and i'm a i'm a converted new yorker kind of at heart i'm, I'm still a new yorker i grew up in the city um ah. and so it it took some uh some some trying to, to get me out here and get me into this lifestyle. Um, but I have been, I have been kind of counting my blessings that we're here, um, mm. particularly for this situation for us to just have space and a little bit of, um, uh, you know, a little bit more, more ability to, to do things without being on top of each other um, on a day-to-day -day basis has been really great. So I'm very grateful for New Jersey, especially right now. And uh, yeah, we're, we're happy to make it our home. You, you say you have a family, obviously. Uh, how many kids you got? 
I've got two kids. They're eight and five. So we have a uh, third grader and a kindergartner. And the, the third grader, he, he knows kind of how to use the computer roughly. Our kindergartner is still learning to read, which makes, you know, <laughs> using a freaking computer kind of challenging. Uh, so she really needs a lot of help with the, with the distance learning. Um, so that's, that's a particularly, you know, challenging thing is making sure that she's able to, uh, to, to, you know, get all that work done, but she's been learning really well. She's been, I think it's been accelerating her reading, uh, quite a bit. So, and, uh, I've been put officially in charge of recess and gym class. Nice. So we have a, we have a predetermined, uh, PE curriculum that's provided by the school in Google classroom which involves these oh. YouTube video workouts and exercises. And oh, wow, really? Stuff. So we've been, we've been having a lot of fun with that, and I've been like getting a decent workout in a couple of times a week <laughs> trying to keep up with, with gym class, so that's been fun. Yeah, I was surprised to, to find out. My, my son, he's uh, in ninth grade, so just starting high school, uh, and they, there's no schedule. They're all remote, but there's no schedule. So he's actually going to bed at like one or three p.m. and then waking up at like midnight wow. and then just finishing that, just doing his work when you know whenever he wants, which is crazy. Like I'm like, how is that okay for? I don't know. I think kids need that structure, but it's the same for yeah. my kids, middle school and high yeah. school. And they're both like, you know, I can do it whenever I feel like it. I'm like, oh, okay, so yeah. it will get done on Friday at the very last minute, right? The very, yeah. very, very last very minute. Last yes, minute. <laughs> yes. I I remember myself when I was that age, and yeah, yeah that's exactly what would happen. Yeah, yeah. minutes before <laughs> the deadline. <laughs> do you have any uh, parenting tips for people with? such as yourself that have a family with two kids, any, any tips or tricks that you learned along the way? Oh, well, I think a good, a good tip is to not be too hard on yourself. I think, especially with, with like the distance learning and all these new um, challenges that are in our lives as parents, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of guidance and there's a lot of requirements, ostensible requirements. And I think, it's important to just keep perspective on how ridiculous and difficult the situation is and not beat yourself up over, you know, not doing exactly what the curriculum is all the time, though I'm sure the school would not love me saying that. Um, but I think, you know, everyone who we've interacted with has been very understanding about the situation. And so I think just as a parent in general, it's easy to think like every, every time you let them watch TV for four hours, like you're going to, kill them or <laughs> ruin their future or something and sometimes in this situation that's kind of what has to happen because if you know my wife is in school as well she has college courses to uh to handle and so you know sometimes we just have to uh to to let them watch moana and that's okay you know so i think that's one thing and then another sort of practical thing that i always recommend to people kind of regardless of their situation is called uh, gtd it's a this philosophy called getting things done, which is kind of like an operating system for your life. It's like a series of productivity techniques. And I talk about it incessantly to the point where people around me, it's like a joke that I talk about it so much, but it really changed my life. And I, it's hard for me to imagine like navigating a situation like this without having a tool like that to keep all of my kind of commitments, my schedule, all those things in line. So I would definitely look into that or really whatever kind of productivity uh, framework makes sense for you um, and just relying on those tools to help you get through this time. OmniFocus? I've, yes, I'm an OmniFocus person. I've got to ask. Yeah. This getting things done. The, so the only time I've ever heard of this before today, before I looked at this, was on the show Dead Like Me, Getting Things Done, getting things done with Dolores. It was her webcam show. Does anybody <laughs> remember this? I love that show, yes. That is yeah. such a great show. No, I so don't know immediately, that. like, I just imagined you with like a little webcam show where you were like, you know, organizing your spice cabinet and like all these people were watching and- <laughs> That's what he means. Yeah. yeah. I, I know that's I, not what it is, but it really like- Season two is coming out. Yeah, <laughs> that's season two. <laughs> I can't wait. Exactly. I think it's out tomorrow, yeah. Yes. I, I totally know what you mean. I have a uh, a five year old boy, and it's sometimes you just gotta be okay with letting things go. the The amount of work that the teachers have provided sometimes feels 
overwhelming and unrealistic because you have a five-year-old stuck in a house. You know, we get out once in a while, but it's, it's not the same thing as being in the school environment uh, right, where right. they know that's where those things get done. So it's, you got to be a little um, lenient on yourself and kind of sometimes you got to be okay with letting things go. This is a phase and it shall pass and yeah, we'll get back exactly. to normality at, at one point. Exactly. No. Yeah. There's nothing it. wrong with that. Like the, the, the teachers have no ability to calibrate the amount of work like there's no precedent for this situation where they've been able to have like a feedback loop. So I know that that since the program has started with our school, our school we're thrilled with and we, we've really loved every uh, teacher that our kids have had there. Um, and they've been super receptive at, to feedback and they have been evolving the program. So I think it's just in general, it's a it's a time to give each other slack and to to not be so hard on each other just in, in every venue of life. And in parenting, you're often your worst critic. So that's why I said that. I talked to my, my boys, my older, because my kids are 18 and 14. So they're a lot older. And we have these conversations. I'll, I'll drive over and, and we take walks because uh, they live with their dad. And one of the things that, that I talk about is like my inability to focus. Like, yes, I'm, I usually work at home. I've worked at home for years and been remote. And like, but this isn't the same thing. It's this is totally different. And so I've had this conversation with them where they're, you know, I'm like, listen, like, I totally get it that you just need sometimes to, to shut your brain off and just do just zone out on a video game or just put on some stupid show and forget, you know, everything's happening. And I think they have told me that they thought that was helpful because they were kind of stressing themselves out. Like, you know, why can't I focus? And I should be able to just knock all this work out and get it done. And, and they're having just as hard of a time as the adults are. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's a great time. It's great for you to have those conversations with them while they're at this age and they're developing their personal kind of strategies for how they're going to approach yep. their their lives. And it's it's really interesting to see like my my eight year old has kind of like a to do list and a, a, a he has things that he's responsible for delivering. And it's slowly separating from the idea that we're responsible for making sure that he delivers them. So it's, it's this interesting uh, shift that I, I think has gotten really accelerated by the situation where, you know, we've, we've allowed him to do more online chat and more, uh, more kind of, you know, interaction with other kids online, which we had been very hesitant about before. And he's like thrust into this situation where he has his own personal responsibility. So it's really, it's interesting how it's kind of like sped Think ultimately be good for them as long as we're in a position to like give them the tools that they need awesome. totally brian was that you there's a dog barking <laughs> oh, okay yeah, yeah it sounded it dog barks every once in a while very little subtle little bar for our audio listeners, listeners that was brian barking uh, now she's now she just put her head in my lap she's like did you say something to me brian's Aww. making all this up again for our audio listeners go watch what? the video you'll you'll there see there is that. no dog it's a phantom dog Oh, oh there a, is a dog. Oh, oh. Look at the face. Adorable. Yeah, she's she just she'll just come over and like stick her her head in my lap. I'm like, what? I didn't say anything to you. <laughs> That's dogs. We've, we're a remote company and we have a couple um uh folks with pets in their houses. And I'm I'm deeply allergic to pets. Oh no. So I can't have any. But I vicariously Sorry. enjoy seeing my uh my my coworkers pets uh on a on a regular basis and hearing the their joyful noises in the background <laughs> in video <laughs> calls but we never mind that and i have my kids interrupt my my video calls all the time too so <laughs> hey ty speaking of your work why don't we why don't we jump into cantilever why don't you tell us a little bit about the company what it does uh one of the videos i watched on the home page it said something about like you guys don't consider websites like a like a like a traditional website like you think of like a digital billboard but it's actually like a, a, a experience a location something that you live with and you'll explain this a lot better than I will obviously because you're the one in the video you mind telling us a little <laughs> bit about it well thanks for the, the wonderful segue that's great um, yeah that that's kind of our core principle which is digital hospitality and digital just, hospitality that's what I was looking for that when you yeah. make a website you're at, you're inviting people into an experience or a space. So it's much more than just kind of telling people things. You're actually creating a space that people are going to, to be in and exist in. And just like any physical space that your business 
opens to the public. You want it to be comfortable. You want it to be intuitive and easy. You want people to leave with a positive impression of your company. So that philosophy kind of permeates the way that we do all of our um, all of our design work and our development work. Uh, I would say we're you know we're we're fairly typical as a studio in the the kinds of work that we do, but it's really that sort of methodology and philosophy that that makes us different. Um, we work with a pretty wide variety of clients from uh, IBM, American Express, International Monetary Fund, down to local small businesses and artists. And so we have a pretty wide range of technologies that we use and, and, uh, and kind of project types that we do. We'll work on intranets and, you know, web apps as well as websites. Um, and we're just, you know, a bunch of, bunch of big nerds love the internet and love making stuff out of it. It's, it's like the greatest thing ever invented. It's, it's amazing. So we're, we're privileged to be able to work on it every day. Uh, and we are a, a nine person team and we're distributed across the U S and Canada. We don't have anyone in the same city. So we have kind of an anchor in LA and we have an anchor, uh, in New York. Um, and we have our, our team kind of everywhere. And so usually, uh, as of February, I was going to be going into New York city, uh, several days a week to increase our presence in the city, uh, after not having been in the city for a long time. And I had to abandon that idea very fast after COVID. So I haven't been to that office in a while, but once everything kind of blows over, uh, you'll, you'll be able to find me there in Midtown. Hit me up. Nice. You know, I want to ask a question, and I think Sarah is going to appreciate this a whole lot. Uh, you I'll ready, Sarah? It. We'll see. No, 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 yeah. no, she will. Can you tell? Oh, geez, Brian. Can you, <laughs> Ty, can, can, can you, can you tell? It's, I'm going to let you down, Brian. It's not that kind of a question. Ty, can you tell us the uh, what's the story behind the name of Cantilever? Great question. Um, so it comes from high school architecture class. I learned about the concept of a cantilever, which is sort of an overhang. So a lot of people might not know this term. Um, and the, the cool thing about a cantilever, if you think of uh, uh, like falling water is like a very famous building that that uses this technique, they look almost uh, magical. So they, they look like they shouldn't be able to exist when they're done well. And the reason that they can exist is because of engineering. So we like the idea of creating things that kind of look almost impossible, but they are totally possible because of science and engineering. So. It's that combination of the creativity and the, the technology that I think makes us. Okay, I, I approve that question. And that's actually very relevant to the site speed stuff. Nice. <laughs> yeah, no, I like that. Sarah, you um, understand where I'm coming from with that question. Yes, I, I, you know what? I love the name. I think that's really great. And I'm glad that it's not a big secret that we, you know. <laughs> Thank you. No, it's, I, I love it. It's served <laughs> us very, very well. The only problem is that sometimes people here can't deliver Oh. Which is precisely oh, yeah. the opposite of what we would like. That would to be the about. opposite of what you want to, want to <laughs> exactly. portray. Yeah. So we we want them to think of can deliver. That's fine, <laughs> but you know. And I, I love how open uh, the company seems to be too. Like uh, all of your stuff being on um, uh, no Notion. Yeah. 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 Nice. Notion and all of your information up there from like how you work, how you function. Uh, I love it when companies do that. Thank Why don't you, you briefly yeah. just uh, communicate what Notion is, just for the people that might not know, Brian? Yeah, um, sure. Notion's essentially like Google Docs on steroids, <laughs> I guess would be the way. It's almost like a, your own wiki, I think would be a, a, a good way of describing it. You have everything from databases to uh, just plain docs, and they can interlink. Uh, yeah, it's no, I think it's like notion.so. I think yeah, it you got it. Yeah, got yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you for noticing that. I'm very impressed with the research. And yeah, we we uh, we love to just try putting things out there and pushing the envelope in terms of transparency. And it's interesting. I was just talking to someone who you know wanted to work with us, and so part of him uh, pitching that he should work with us is like he actually read our handbook and you know was talking to us about the way that we work. And it's like that's the kind of thing that becomes an opportunity if you're open is that people who vibe with your philosophy will find you. Um, and it's kind of scary, you know, it's like, it's weird kind of leaving your yeah. dirty laundry out yeah. there. But um, like, I found this also with, with podcasting, cause I do, I do a soccer podcast 
And initially I thought like, I'm, I'm kind of a different person on that soccer podcast than I am in most like business interactions, for instance, my language is cer certainly different. Uh, my, very vulgar. my attitude <laughs> can be very different. So initially I was like, I was pretty paranoid, I guess, about like saying the wrong thing or being, mm. you know, offending someone or something, you know, having, having some effect on my, my career, or my family or whatever. Um, but the more I found that like, you know, if, you, if you're out there, you're genuine, and you're trying to do your best, I think people tend to recognize that. And it doesn't have to be perfect, but people enjoy, you know, like what you all do with nice, casual, loose conversation, I think can be can be great. And people don't, people don't sweat the small stuff as much as you think they will or dig through your right. archives on your flaws. You know? it, it's good to show you, show your work, basically. Just show this yeah. is where I, I came from and this is yeah. where I am. Like we have like tons of, like hundreds of videos on our YouTube channel from like way back. And we have episode one you can listen to. It's horrible, but you know, it, show, <laughs> it shows our progress. So yeah, yeah. I, I love having it up there. Yeah, absolutely. And with that podcast, I've had the experience of being able to go to games and interview some players and I've, had the thought that if they heard what I said about them, like last week, oh, God. they would really not want to talk <laughs> <Yeah>. to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but luckily we've been like under the radar enough that, that people haven't, uh, haven't noticed yet. So maybe. Can I end up being like, yeah, yeah go ahead. Fred. Can I ask you a question about soccer? Why oh. is American football uh taking the name of what really soccer is it's football and why why in america is it called soccer and not football that's a great question so i know so i know the origin of the term soccer which is that Ooh, let's hear that in in england in the early formation of the game now known as as uh, football in most places there were different sort of branches or different variants of it and the variant oh that we know and love was called association football, which got shortened to soccer. So soccer oh. is actually a British term that then carried to different parts of the, uh, the, the Commonwealth. So in Australia, it's called soccer. I think in South Africa as well, it's called soccer. Uh, different places that, that picked up kind of English terminology in one, for one reason or another. Um, and the reason I don't know why American football is called football, but it, I, I assume it must have derived from the same kind of tree and just like split off. Probably, but it's really it's throw ball, really. It's but throw and kick. It's it's ru it's, it's, it's rugby. It's like just it's, more yeah, yeah, it's, it's rugby more like with pads. American rugby, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I I mean, yeah, I I enjoy and appreciate all sports, and uh, uh, so you know, no no ill will either way, but I'm. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. curious to look that up now. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just wanted to know the name. It's one of those questions. And when I saw, your, you know, about the podcast, I was like, oh, I, I got to ask you that. Association football. The real question I would love to know is like why people here don't like soccer. <laughs> there are a lot of people with many different theories. but it's, I think it's more it's commercial stuff. But I, I think it's just what Americans uh, push. But um, what's, what's well, been, what, what, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so why did you and your, uh, your brother start the podcast anyway? Uh, well, I think we started it cause we were just like, we would talk, uh, on the phone after games and just banter for 30 minutes. And we figured that it might be funny to someone. <laughs> why not so, record this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so being yeah. like horrible egomaniacs, we thought someone might actually want to listen to it. So we, we recorded it. And then I started doing things like I started doing a, a terrible impersonation of the coach, uh, say like saying stupid things and things like that, just just to spice it up. And before long, we had a show. So and we're now like 150 episodes in. We have a, a wonderful third co-host who helps cover the the women's national team, which I'm not as much of a fan of. Uh, well, I'm a big fan, but not an expert. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's become a thing and uh, a, a beloved part of my life. It's like a little, little escape and a, an excuse to just talk to my brother for an hour. And we're, we've been, we've been grateful to find a lot of uh, weirdos out there who like it. And, <laughs> and, I love that. and, and what's the info? What's oh the yeah. Name? The, the yeah. show is called we, the peeps and it's at WTPpod.com. We cover the U S men's national soccer team and the U S women's national soccer team. And we were originally called We the People. That was the origin of the name. Mm. But 
we yeah. changed it for SEO reasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 We're not going to beat the preamble. <laughs> no, probably not. <laughs> well, you're competing with peeps, so. Right. We are competing with uh, peeps. We, get, we got some, we, we have a, a yearly award show that's called the peeps and the, the, the main award, the like best picture equivalent is the golden peep for which we always use a picture of the, the sort of like, uh, what would you call it? The canonical peep, you know, the perfect still, little bit of marshmallow. I still don't know who likes peeps. those. Quintessential who, peep. Who likes peeps? Right here. I've never. I like peeps. Let, How? Yeah. Why? Why? <laughs> why? What do you mean no. why? Wait, That's a redundant okay. question. No, wait, hold on. <laughs> do, you, do you also like candy corn? Oh my God! You know me. I love candy corn like Andrew, crazy. That's disgusting. No, so you can't. I, I love it. It. Wait, I you love can't it. like peeps and you then say like that about candy corn. Then about candy corn. I fair. love candy corn. Fair, fair. Do you like, uh, like crazy. wafers? Excuse me. Do you like Necco wafers? Oh, like Necco they're okay. Wafers? They're okay. Like that. Communion wafers with. Communion wafers. A bit of communion dust wafers. <laughs> what are Necco? What? I have a whole what bunch of communion wafers for no reason. What NECA? NECA? It's, like a, it's like a defunct candy that was around like yeah. when I was a kid. The My chocolate one was super gross. The, you, know, you don't see what you call it. chocolate candy. Is. I like I like the information about it. The production of the candy is currently on hiatus as of July 2018. They don't it's say on, it's, it's on just hiatus. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just taking <laughs> a little break. Like, I, like I, Tupac I, is just missing. You got to put the link to that in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's for sale though. That's why I like they're. Tr- uh, oh, yes. Okay. I think some people might be trying to bring it back. Oh, yeah. I remember yeah. the, the, the the like multicolored things. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. They're just they're basically um, like like tums, but without the medicine. It's just like a chalky <laughs> yeah, super <laughs> wafer. Yeah, it's kind but of anyway. a thin version of those little um, heart things. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's just like those heart things. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever uh, those are called. I, I like Peeps things. because I had them when I was a child, and they, it's like a sense memory. It's, I love When them. did Peeps come out? I don't remember. 1977. <laughs> they've, been, they've been re-releasing this Very good ones. year. They just keep recalling don't. them and then Yeah, exactly. Them. exactly. No, now I need to know. You want an original 77 Peep. That's the... That's the <laughs> it's the quintessential that's, Peep. That's, that's the one it's you like It's like wine. It's like a fine wine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> 78 was not such a good year. 1950. The tannins on the 79 are fantastic. 1950 what? <laughs> 1953. We oh, really digress God. here. Sarah, why don't you kick us off with, with the actual <laughs> like main topic of our show? I just want to keep talking about peeps. <laughs> I want to talk about what you call it. Sarah, what's the main topic of our show? What are we talking about? <laughs> the main topic, if we can get back on track, and I don't know why you're trusting me because I have a family right now and I'm getting all the wrong words coming out. You're the one that took all the notes. I didn't take all the notes. Ty did the notes, and I just heard Okay, it. our topic is oh. web performance. <laughs> you, why, Brian. why the heck should we care? I don't, I don't understand. Why should I care about web performance, Ty? Tell me. Oh, Especially Brian. right now, Ty. Come oh, on. Brian. So, yeah, so uh, web performance, or I, I was just talking to a, a, a gentleman on Twitter whose article I put in the show notes. That was a really great article about Google Tag Manager. We were talking about how... Um, the term web performance kind of means nothing to people who don't like make websites. So we were thinking like site speed. So you could think of it as site speed. And why should you care about site speed? So if you have a website, no amount of great design and great content and whatever you're doing can fix a slow website. If your website is slow, people are not going to use it and they are not going to come back. So this, you know, is a is a thing that we focus on hugely at Cantilever because of that philosophy of digital hospitality. If someone's waiting 10 seconds to get into the website, that's not a very hospitable experience. And so I think the main reason that you need to think about the speed of your site is the results that you get. And that comes directly from the experience that people have. So there've been a number of studies that show that, you know, even if your site is a second slower, two seconds slower, it can just torpedo your uh, your results in terms of conversions or you know, newsletter signups or whatever you're trying to do. Um, a second factor that's very important with site speed is uh, SEO, search engine optimization. So if you have a website that is slow, Google is going to penalize you in search rankings. So even if you have a site that otherwise would show very highly, Google doesn't want its users to have a bad experience. So if it thinks that you're going to have, uh, you're going to, your site's going to be slow, it won't send them there. 
Um, another one is just thinking about your resources and being efficient. We've encountered sites where they were so slow and the solution to that was that the client was paying you know, hundreds of dollars in server fees to make, to mm, send some yeah. quad core behemoth to you know, serve this thing so that it wouldn't be mega, mega slow. And that's going to cost you know, hundreds of dollars a month. And, and it's, that really adds up fast. So, uh, so you know, making your site faster can also save you a lot on, on resources. Um, another reason is accessibility. So people who use assistive mm -hmm. technologies to use websites, if your website is slow, the screen reader, like for a blind user, for instance, the screen reader is going to start like reading stuff and then other stuff's going to load in and it just makes yeah. for an especially bad experience for someone who's in that situation who is already uh, you know likely to be more challenged using your website than other people um, and the last thing is just that when you make a site really slow it kind of encourages you to make it well or sorry when you make it fast it encourages you to make it well so you're paying attention to all the details of how you know everything that's going into the website and all the code and when you go through the process of trying to optimize a site, it just pushes you into habits that make the site and the code better as a whole. So that's why you should care, Brian. Is that that's, yeah, Brian. that's good. Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks. I mean, I, I just want to look pretty. I mean, that's all I care about. Um, Brian just I, wants his website I, that's running on ASP to look pretty. Uh, I, the one thing I'm curious about, this is kind of drama-ish topic question related to this. What do you Here think we go. of Here we of go. AMP? Of AMP? Oh yeah, I was thinking AMP. about that. So yeah, AMP is a, a new sort and, of and what is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It's yeah. it's a it's a the new Googles. standard for um, websites that's that is promoted heavily by Google and I think a couple other uh, stakeholders. And the idea is that if you have a website page, you can, as a developer, you can create an AMP version of it, and the AMP version has uh, stripped down code that has to adhere to certain standards. So you're not allowed to have third-party JavaScript. You're only allowed to have a certain subset of CSS. You have to keep your images a certain size, things like that. And what will happen is if someone's coming to your website from Google and you have an AMP version of your page um, and they're on a phone, uh, Google will send them to the AMP version, which will make their experience faster. But on top of that, Google will actually cache your AMP version of your page so that when people go there from Google in the future, it loads like instantaneously. So it provides a really good experience. So if you're if you manage a site that does, you know, thousands of hits a day, especially from Google, it is well worth worth looking into um, as a as a potential benefit. Uh, it does incur a lot of like you know engineering costs and things like that, but it's a it's a really good technique. Oh, yeah. Oh, I was it, expecting uh... more drama about that. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> Some people don't have a problem. Let me uh, let me ask a user question, um, or rather someone sure. uh, yeah. uh, texting us from uh, from the live feed here. Liam Ramsey is asking, what other things can be done for accessibility with websites? So I'm guessing his question is rooted with speed and accessibility. I, I'm not sure what other means, but um, I'm guessing that you'll have some uh, some tips, Ty. Yeah, absolutely. And Liam, Liam is a plant. Liam, Liam works with us at, at Cantilever, and he's a he's a wonderful guy. And, Hi, Liam. Uh, hey, Liam. Uh, and yeah, uh, when it comes to accessibility, I think you know, uh, site speed is a is a part of it. But the main things that you need to focus on are making sure that you're delivering code that can be reasonably parsed and understood by assistive technologies. So when people with disabilities are using a website, usually they're not using it with the same input and output devices that, uh, that, that many people are. And so you need to ensure that your code is set up to properly be, uh, be used by those technologies. Um, however, there's a whole other side of it, which is in design. So if you're designing a website, you need to understand the kinds of design that are likely to work for the most people and make sure that, for instance, I'm, I have a red green color blindness, so sometimes it's very hard for me to tell the difference between a, you know, like a red cancel button and a green submit button. So you you should uh, know kind of the common th issues that people might have using your design and mitigate against them as much as possible. Does that um, mean Sarah's head looks green too? Sarah's hair looks green too. I'm just curious. Well, know. she does have green hair, so yeah, makes sense. True. 
What I so, yeah, I, I commonly don't know what color people's hair is. I'll put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so what what uh what what's the really big thing about performance right now? Obviously, you know, we have a situation where everyone is using the internet at the same time. We had this kind of cadence everyone. where we'd have yeah, everyone, literally, where we had this shut up, Brian, where we had this cadence where people would go to work and we'd use internet in a certain kind of way and fashion and bandwidth and we'd come home and there'd be a difference. And now everybody's, everybody, thank you, Brian, is online at the same time, <laughs> apparently in a Zoom everybody. meeting for 12 hours. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So <laughs> tell me what what is so important about performance right now and what do we do to address it? So I think it's just that it's a much more much more populated competition. So if you are not populated, but it's it's becoming harder just because of what you said about, you know, everyone using the same infrastructure all at once. So if your site was going to load slowly before, it's yeah. going to load even more slowly now for a great deal of users. And, you know, especially when you think about, you know, mobile networks or, or people who don't have great internet access, um, you know, if, if your site was kind of on the verge, it's now a huge problem. Um, and I think you know everyone has a way that they can improve the the speed of their uh, of their website or their application. Um, and now is a great time to look into those things because it's just going to have such a tangible impact on your bottom line as a company. So you know, in thinking about um, uh, coming on the show, I was just thinking that you know performance has this kind of geeky side, and there's there's a lot of really sort of interesting engineering topics uh, that come along with it. But your show caters to a more general audience, you know, nerds of all stripes who are involved in different aspects of technology. And I was just realizing how much performance is not just an engineering topic. It's a stakeholder topic. It's a design topic. It's really something that has to be integrated with the, uh, with the mentality of the whole team when they're creating a software product like a website. And you know, even if you're a solopreneur and you're throwing up a, a WordPress site, um, if you think about performance, you're going to be ahead of the curve. And you know, if you imagine someone going to shop on a bunch of different websites, the, they're gonna, if they're looking for the same product on five different websites, the one that gives them the best experience is pretty likely to win, right? So you want to take every edge you can, especially now when the, the infrastructure is so taxed. Yeah. Now how, how do you know if uh, your site is actually performing well or not? I mean, I load it. It's fine for me. I mean, I don't understand the problem. <laughs> like, yeah, so there are a number of, of techniques that you can use. Um, I think the first place to go would be some automated tools. So uh, there like are... Lighthouse? Yeah, so the, the most uh, easy one I would say to pick up would be, would be the Google tool, which is called Lighthouse. And to do that, you just have to go into Google Chrome. You open up the inspector. You just right click on the page and click inspect. And then there's a, a tab for audits. And under that, you can test your website's speed. And Google also publishes some other um, places where you can just like punch in the URL of your website. And it will test it on a separate server. And that's all using the same kind of rule set and criteria. And uh, there's another one called uh, web page test as well, which is a, a you know, tried and true method. And these tests, what they end up giving you is kind of like a, it's like a waterfall chart. So it shows you first how long the server that your website is on takes to respond to the user's request and deliver some code. Then it shows you all the other things that the website had to load in order to render the results on the screen. It'll show you the point at which your website was actually fully rendered. And it'll give you all these other cool little, little metrics around um, the performance. But the other thing I really encourage is for people to actually go out and test their website and test it in circumstances that they themselves don't usually find themselves in. So if you're on the latest iPhone, try loading someone else's uh, you know, old Android phone from four years ago and pull up your site and see how the, the experience is. And if you're usually 3G. at home, yeah, try 3G, try um, you know, bad coffee shop Wi-Fi, uh, try all the situations that you suspect your users might be in. Even I, one thing I like to do is just try loading some of our sites on the subway and see like when you have that like intermittent mm. kind of in and out connection, how that affects the, the experience. 
So I think it's, it has to be a combination. You want to try some of those synthetic tools because they give you very like repeatable scientific results that you can then take action against, but you also really need to try it yourself. And the, the other aspect there is there's, there's ultimately really two kinds of performance. There's the by the book performance, which is the real performance. That's like actually, you know, how long is it taking? And then there's the perceived performance, which is as a user, how fast is the, this experience loading to the point where I'm satisfied? You know, like I don't necessarily care if every little ad, yeah. is, if I can read the article, I'm, I'm happy. So the synthetic tools, they can both overrate and underrate your performance at times. And so that's why it's especially important to really, really try it and to be honest with yourself. You know, if you if you're loading your site on your computer with good Wi-Fi all the time, you're just not going to notice some of the problems that your users are having. And if you kind of sweep that under the rug, you're leaving money on the table. Um, and what's what's like especially insidious with page performance, site performance, is that even if you look at your Google Analytics and you see like your bounce rate, for instance, in Google Analytics, that's how many people came to your web page and just left without clicking on another page. That metric might look okay, but Google Analytics can't even track the people who didn't even get to that point because your web page was slow, so they didn't even load. So there are going to be people who tried to go yeah. to your website, and they got the little spinny thing, and then they left because they got frustrated, and they never even appear in your results. So if, you, if you're not trying it yourself, then you're never going to know that. I feel like we should bring back the uh, the splash page with uh, you know, the, know. The, the the gears and the giant door that opens up and we can pre cache the whole the site. loading. I want yeah. I want flash loaders. No. So what about what about tech stacks? Uh, I mean, is it is it better if we start talking about uh, Jam? Like if, if we're serving flat yeah. stuff. So, yeah, I don't I don't want to piss anybody off. <laughs> I th any modern stack is going to have encountered this problem, right? And, and it's going to have some facilities to make sure that your site is sufficiently fast to meet needs. But I do think that when you are considering stacks, you do need to think about relative performance because like even within the Jamstack model, uh, there are frameworks that are bigger and more heavy. And there are, you, you can use uh, vanilla JavaScript and you can write your own framework. So you really need to evaluate from the beginning whether your, your tech stack and your entire plan for the website makes sense given the sort of goals that you have for the performance of the site. And that's another thing is that like performance can be relative. If you're loading a internal page that a user has logged in and it's loading a ton of data and you know, like it's like a like an intranet or something, and they're loading a bunch of stuff. They might not mind so much if it takes five seconds, right? But if you are serving news articles and people are clicking from Facebook and they're trying to read a news article, five seconds is going to kill you. So it really needs to be a, a process of thinking what what is our actual goal here, and how are we going to achieve that? And you have to pick your stack that, in a way that's kind of fitting with your goal. So usually like when people pick a tech stack, they're usually thinking about themselves and their own experience <laughs> with whatever technology is being promoted um, or you know, considered. But it's very important to think about you know, ultimately how many kilobytes of data are gonna come with all of this stuff. And if we shifted direction, could that be ameliorated? So I think one of the big recommendations I would have for technical teams is to start thinking about performance like a budget. So this is a very common mentality or methodology with teams where you go into a project and you say, we want it to, let's say we want it to load in under two seconds, uh, the homepage. We want the homepage to load in under two seconds. That becomes sort of a benchmark where as new features are designed and as you go into development, everyone on the team can be thinking about, well, is this getting us closer or further from that benchmark? Or maybe your benchmark is based on kilobytes sent over the wire for a given request or, uh, or however you want to define it. If you have those goals set and visible as a team, I think it makes it a lot easier to have these conversations. And then it becomes valid for people to say, you know, maybe we shouldn't add this 
cool feature, or maybe we need to do this cool feature in a slightly different way because it's going to influence this performance benchmark that we all agreed was important. Yeah, and by budgeting, you're you're looking at from the sense of you know how much data you're loading. So, do you really need that th those four different fonts for your home page, and yeah. and all those images that they need to come at once uh, can they lazy load? And, um, yeah, right. Sure. What other things are you are are like? Would you put into that whole budget? Like what what other items can people look at? Yeah. So. I think it depends on what your site does and it depends on what's taking time. So that, that's why it's, it's yeah. very important to profile because you might have a site, like if I tell you that two sites load in five seconds, that doesn't tell you anything about the composition of those five seconds. So it could be four seconds, the server is crunching through a million WordPress plugins, or it could be that the server is fine, but there's a piece of JavaScript that takes a while to load. Um, so. I think when it comes to like areas where you can look to improve, there are some very common things that you should look out for. Um, but it's mainly about testing it so that you kind of can tell what those things are. Um, so like if you're a uh, sort of like a DIY site owner and you're building sites with wordpress.org, .com, sorry, wordpress.com or Squarespace or whatever, um, I think it's it's well worth it to just to test it try taking different aspects of your website and just like turning them off. You know, maybe you have a staging server, you can clone your site and you can just turn certain pieces off, certain plugins maybe that are running and you can just see the results. Just keep loading the site and see, you know, when you, when you turn off this, this gravity forms or whatever it is, how is the page load impacted? And that gives you some inkling as to what the culprit might be. Um, but yeah, I think the fonts are very important. You need to look at that you need to look at kind of any time you have third parties adding code to your site, tracking codes, things like that. Uh, any iframes that are loading when the page loads and, and so on. I got a question, Sarah, what about, what do you think? I would love to get your perspective on this because from, from your perspective, when you start a project like this, and I, I don't know how much websites you do. I don't know if you're doing more applications at this part of your career. What, what, do you have any kind of um, thoughts on what the best uh, things to think about at, at, at maybe the phase where you begin a project are and uh, what to think about from there? It, it's funny that, that you turn to me because so, I mean, you all know I work for Honeycomb, which I don't, I don't really talk a lot about what I do here, but um, it is an application, but the whole goal of, of Honeycomb is to help people better understand um, their tech stack, right? What are the, un know the unknown unknowns and, and all of these things. Uh, and so a big thing that we do on a daily basis is talk about how can we make that experience better um, while at the same time dog fooding that to make our experience better. So we spend a lot of time like looking at our service level of, of objectives and looking at these strange blips and like, why is that slow? And what would happen if we take this out? And what would happen if we added this in? Um, and from the design side, uh, often I'm brought in to talk about what are the different options in terms of should we do lazy loading? Is that even an option on this particular page? Um, perceived performance. So looking at it from, there's no way that, that we're going to be able to load this much data and it's not going to take time. So what can we do while the user is waiting for that to make it seem like it's not taking that long? Um, so, you know, yes, I work on a lot, a lot of different things. And this is something that I always think about from a design perspective, always. I've always want to know what's the stack, what, what what's the audience, what, what do we expect them to be using, um, you know, persona wise to a certain extent, like where are they coming from and, and what's their internet speed um, and really getting a better idea. And then just really what is their purpose for being here and making that as seamless as possible um, time wise. Do you have any recommendations on like best practices or for designers? Well, no, no, just just for some, t maybe it is for designers, sure. But like some some tips that like, within your experience that you just cited, like, is there any kind of like, like one or two tips, like things that you could think of that would be uh, that would behoove someone to think about uh, when they uh, embark on this kind of a project? Uh, everything I just said. <laughs> Design system. Is that what you're trying to get at? Are you trying to get to a design system? Oh, design no. systems. You may not it's even the book by <laughs> Sarah Besselhoff. Like, what Wait, this what is this coordinated? Design <laughs> systems. What is he If you want to know, <laughs> yes, this I'm, was all for, for this. 
Oh if you want to okay. know more of Sarah Veselov's thoughts, download okay. or purchase Building Design Systems by Sarah Veselov. That was elaborate. That so was like, I, well, I, I was not in on that. Oh, okay. I just thought of that because because of your experience. <laughs> But that, that, I think that's exactly the kind of thing that designers should be thinking about is like, yeah. I think there was, there was an era where design, you know, design and development were very, very much separate. And yeah. you thought of design as being all about the sexy and development is all about just like making it happen. And the disciplines are coming together so much now where if you have a design system that you've mapped out in Figma for your web application, that becomes an amazing opportunity for your engineering team to optimize your app because they don't have to build three carousels. They know that it's one carousel that has three variations and it's yeah. been designed from the start to do that. Yeah, and we're, we're doing that right now. And the, the funny thing is, is, you know, I, I talked to so many people and, you know, I've, I've, I've had the privilege to work at some pretty cool places with some really cool people. And people have this idea of like, oh, like you worked at GitLab and everything must be amazing. Like the way they developed it. Like, no, when I started at GitLab, everything was done in jQuery. And there was like this huge like overhaul that needed to be done to put it into components. And I, I, I will say at Honeycomb, we're not using jQuery that I'm aware of, but we are putting in this a lot of effort right now to refactor and get our React components um, tightened up and performing a lot better. Exactly the way you just said, like, do we really need three different versions of this or is this just different states of the same component? And, and what, how can we maximize that? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and in all seriousness, I was I wasn't trying to get to the a joke about the book. I was I was just more <laughs> stating that I mean that just that just worked out that just way. But, it did. Uh, yeah, it, it really did. But what I'm trying to say is that it, it's really important that we start thinking about this stuff way down the road, especially in wh where we where we're thinking with our design caps, our user yeah. experience caps. Like that stuff needs to be thought of before it gets to anyone else. At, at least every it. it the whole process needs to be uh, inclusive is basically yeah. what I'm trying to say. And the yeah. more we have this in inclusive kind of uh, a logic around our projects, the better the result is going to be. Yeah. yeah. And totally we, right. we build stuff for clients. Uh, we, we don't work on our own products. Um, so when we're doing our design work, it's very important for us to actually emphasize the importance of speed with our clients because otherwise um, they might tend towards choosing options or pushing us towards towards things that are not performant. So it's part of our job and our responsibility to kind of educate them on why site speed matters and how their choices could impact the ultimate speed of the experience. So I think you're exactly right. It has to be a, uh, a, a conversation from the start. And when people understand kind of a massive effect that site speed will have on their site's ultimate, uh, you know, money bottom line revenue performance. Uh, they become very invested similarly in, in making sure that that it's top notch. Absolutely. Well, hey, we're getting to the end of the show, and I think Brian, it's about time for what? Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, all all this stuff that we're talking about takes a lot of sometimes. Some of it takes time, but you know, it doesn't take a lot of time. Is lightning round because it's super fast. Um, super fast. It's a, it's a bunch of questions we're going to ask you rapidly. Uh, where that's you know, Sarah prepared. Sarah's going to get mad. Frederick's going to cry. I might sob. Um, so uh, I'll <laughs> I'll kick it off uh, with a question. So, what's an ir irrational fear that you have? Oh, wait, this is supposed to be fast. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, fast. Go, 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 go. Never, questions. But not answering on time. First, first thing that pops in your head. Uh, spiders? OK, Fred. I don't like them. That's rational, though. They're dangerous. <laughs> what was your favorite cartoon as a kid, Ty? Dragon Ball Z. Easy. Shout Heck out, yeah. Goku. Kami, Kami. Oh, um, <laughs> if, if for one day, there was no pandemic and everything went back to normal, oh. but it was just one day. Yeah. What, what would you absolutely have to go do? I love eating in restaurants. So I'd, I would just eat in restaurants all day. I love restaurants. Okay. What so chore thing. do you absolutely hate doing? I do not like cleaning the bathroom. It's gross. Ty, if you could be any Dragon Ball Z character, excluding Frieza, who would you be? <laughs> Um, I mean, the purple guy, purple and white guy. Goku's okay. cool. 
Well, yeah. I don't know. Obviously. Who's the, who's the like fat guy who's like always just around? The He's, he becomes like their coach. Oh, you're um, talking about the the, uh, the old guy? No, uh, no. There's, uh, there's like the trainer. Oh man. All right. Oh, King, Are you talking about uh, the King. Uh... King Kai. King Kai. Yeah. yeah. King Kai. Uh, well, he's on a different sure, planet, King Kai, with the little monkey. Okay. Yeah. King Kai's ah, good. rats. Okay. So yeah. Sarah? Sarah? I, I had a question that I just lost control of that. Like, what in the hell was that? Um, Brian? No. No. I'm ready. All right. Soy milk or almond milk? I'm allergic to soy milk. So I'll have to go with almond milk. But soy milk is does taste better. It just, like, would give me a terrible stomachache. So. So Ty, go you're over. in this, you're in this circus. Would you rather be the person with their head inside the lion's mouth, or get shot out of the cannon? Cannon, baby. Let's go. Right. Ty, it is raining. It is pouring. It is late at night. I mean, like <laughs> it's four in the morning. You come home. You're just like you just want to get in the house. You get walk in the door, and there's a ghost. What do you do? Hmm. Probably start asking questions. I, I think I'd be okay. I'd be relaxed. I figured that I would assume positive intent, and I would just get a dialogue going and see see what's what's up. See how I right can answer, help. Sarah. <laughs> All right. So, if you could make one, what do they call them? Cryptozoology, like Sasquatch or Loch Ness. Uh, if you could pick one of those things to be real. Which one would it be and why? Well, I, I think calling back to Jerseyness, I'll have to go Jersey Devil. Because oh, the Jersey Devil, yeah, yeah it's, it's out there. It's going to get you. But I do, I do have a soft spot for uh, for Bigfoot. I think Bigfoot. I would love for that to be real. I mean, he seems seems like a like a misunderstood figure. Probably yeah. is. Yeah. Like to, <laughs> it's no better. <laughs> it's better. No. <laughs> Um, what, what a fact amazes you every time you think of it? The entire internet. It's like, it's, it, I can't believe it. it's a series of tubes. I can't believe it works. Like what, <laughs> what are the tubes that connect me to you that I can talk to you right now? It's insane. It's like millions of hours of human effort to allow us to talk to each other right now. And it's, it's astounding. It's a miracle. I, in all seriousness, Try to answer this the best you can. What right. is your favorite thing about yourself? I like being with people. I'm kind of, a, I'm an ambivert. So I, I like to be alone, but I do like to be with people. And I think when I feel best is when I'm balancing both of those things and having great experiences with other people that are memorable. Those are my best days. So I think that's, that's probably my favorite thing about myself. Nice. What a nice question. That, that really makes makes people feel good. Yeah, you say that. that. Yeah. Thanks. Good. Yeah. Done. Yeah, I find it insightful. <laughs> a pleasure to be on. And no, it's end of lightning round. I mean, you, I can't beat that. Oh, okay. Are we, uh, uh, Brian? Do you have any more questions? Oh, yeah. what, what? What? One more. Like, how okay. do you get a uh, squirrel to like you? What? <sighs> You act like a nut. You act like a nut. Ah. <laughs> my my son, my eight year old, has been testing me by by oh, asking me jokes dad that joke. he has heard. <laughs> yeah, asking me dad jokes and trying to figure out if I can get the answer. I have a very love, good record, so I'm disappointed gotta, in myself that I didn't get. It. I kind of like that joke. I'm gonna tell my wife that actually when I go downstairs in a minute. Ty, two last questions for you, yes, unrelated please. to lightning round. So we're uh, uh, moving past that. First off, what Thunder is the round. best way people could find out more about you? What's your website? What's Cantilever's website? What's your Twitter handle? All that. Thank you. Uh, so I, my Twitter handle is at Ty Fuji, T-Y-F-U-J-I. I don't have a website of my own anymore because I ran out of time to make one. Uh, so that's the best place to find out about me. Cantilever is at cantilever.co, not .com, but .co. And we are at cantileverco on Twitter and cantilever web on Instagram and all those cool places. Cantilever.co. Do, do you mind just spelling out cantilever for the people that cannot spell like myself? I, I do it all the time. C-A-N-T-I-L-E-V-E-R dot C-O. Perfect. And the very last question, Ty, 
is do you have any kind of final words for our audience? Anything that you'd like to uh, bestow here at the end? Deep, meaningful. <sighs> Deep and meaningful. I'm not so good at that. Um, I would say go, go easy on yourself. Like we were saying earlier about parenting, you know, I think I, this is the advice that I need for myself all the time is, you know, we're very lucky. We're, we're incredibly lucky in the scale of human history to be able to even do something like this right now. So if you're on a computer looking at this, you're lucky too. And uh, try to try to look on look on the bright side in this difficult time. I know it's it's beyond challenging for for many many people, but if you give yourself give yourself some slack, a, a, we're we're gonna get through it. Don't you know? Hit hit up hit up the Ben and Jerry's. It's okay. We're all doing it, and we'll we'll get through it together. Thank you, Thunder Nerds. Thank yeah, you. thank you, Ty. This was a blast. I, I really enjoyed this. I want to do this every week. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, you're invited. <laughs> Anybody else have any uh, final, final questions for Ty? Um, I just say thanks for joining us and taking the time, you know, this evening to spend with us. So, yeah. yeah, thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you all. Good night. Yeah, thank you so much, Ty. Thanks, everybody, for Bye. watching. Take care. Bye.